Now, I don't get to use my college education very much these days. Um, there's just not much use for aerospace engineering in my life unless I'm playing Kerbal Space Program. But as I was preparing for this message, I started to think about entropy. Entropy was one of the more interesting yet difficult to understand concepts that I learned, or at least at first it was pretty difficult. Um, it it's, feels pretty abstract, but it also is somehow measurable. We could look at tables and charts for entropy. That's entropy there on the horizontal axis. And I, at one point, knew how to read and tell you and how to use that. Um, I don't anymore at all. Yeah, um, it's been a few years. But at least, you know, can talk a little bit about entropy. In thermodynamics, it's defined as a quantity representing the unavailability of a system's thermal energy con for conversion into mechanical work, often interpreted as the degree or of disorder or randomness in the system. You know, again, as I said, maybe a little confusing at first, but um, it can also be, I think, put a little more simply. Entropy is chaos. It is disorder. One of the principles of entropy is that in a closed system, entropy is always increasing. On a cosmic scale, entropy is what will lead to the inevitable heat death of the universe, as the, the natural order of the universe is moving from order to disorder. Now, on a more practical scale, entropy, you know, we can use entropy to mean that anything, when left to its own devices, moves towards disarray. We can, we can think of entropy in regards to remarkably simple and relatable concepts. And that is what I think to me makes entropy so interesting and a lot easier to understand than it may first appear. Here's an example of everyday entropy. Um, who here has ever dealt with the struggle of tangled headphones? Just raise your hand. Yeah, that's pretty universal. I mean, if, if anybody isn't raising their hands, then I'm assuming you've just never used headphones. Um, I mean, it just seems to be inevitable. Why do headphones always get tangled? Why is that? Why is that so inevitable? Well, entropy in a way. Like think about your headphones. There's like one perfect untangled arrangement of your headphones. It's like laid out straight with no twists or turns. Like that's the only way to ever, you know, even then. Um, but then there's like practically an infinite number of combinations of knots and tangles and, and twists and turns. So no matter how carefully we wrap up our headphones, we lay the cord over itself and then when we put them into our pocket or into our bag, it, it just takes the slightest jostle to shift the cord around into one of those infinite imperfect arrangements and it gets tangled. And then once our headphones are tangled, they'll probably never magically untangle themselves. There's like the one combination that's untangled in the infinite, like they're just gonna keep getting into different tangled arrangements. It's chaos, it's disorder. That's what it means when I say that entropy will always increase in a closed system. On their own, the headphones are only gonna get more and more tangled. And to fix our headphones, we have to put energy into untangling them. We add energy into the closed system of our headphones to undo the chaos. Another example that should be pretty universal, who has ever cleaned up a dirty house or how to clean your dirty room. Yeah. Um, now, if you aren't raising your hand or like you, cause you've just never cleaned or because you think my house has never been dirty, well then I, then your house is filthy right now and please don't invite me over. Um, but if you've ever had a dirty house and if you've ever cleaned your dirty house, consider this, how much more effort does it take to make a house clean than it takes to make a house dirty. Like it's a lot more, isn't it? It takes a tremendous amount of energy to clean a house. Enough that like many people consider it worthwhile um, to pay somebody else to clean their house. Brad has up here like bragged about, about that because he hates cleaning a dirty house. It is not fun. Um, yeah, however, it, it takes like no energy at all to make a house dirty. You know, I can, I can spend an afternoon cleaning the whole house. I can have all our dishes, put, I get the kitchen clean, put away all our dishes, and then Megan and I make like one meal together and like the kitchen is chaos. Like the sink is full of pretzels and spatulas, the stove is covered with like every pan we used. 
the um, plates and forks that we used are just sitting on the table because we don't actually have room for them like anywhere else, like on the counter. So they just sit there. Um, every Thursday, we have to clean up the whole like living room so that we can host postgrad group. And then by Friday, all that clutter has still somehow reaccumulated on our coffee table, on our couch, and on any other surface that I could have just left something rather than use the energy to put away. Until we put energy into cleaning our houses, the entropy only continues to increase until the inevitable heat death of the universe. And people are also prone to entropy. We will just default to what is easy instead of what takes energy and that leads to disorder and disarray. You know, our good habit of working out falls apart because it's just easier to stay on the couch. Our plan to eat healthy fails when we pull into the McDonald's drive through because it's just easier and cheaper and tastier than whatever we were gonna cook at home. Our finances fall out of order if we don't put energy into tracking them and staying on top of our budget. Our friendships end when we settle for just reading their Facebook status instead of reaching out and initiating plans together. Our marriages fall apart when we settle into just being roommates because that takes less effort than continually pursuing one person for years after the initial sign, shine and excitement has worn off. We face entropy in the church. Left towards our own devices, we turn inwards instead of outwards. We ask the church to take care of us, to feed us spiritually, or to just entertain us instead of reaching out, loving people, and serving others. We expect the church to be responsible for our spiritual growth because we don't want to give the time and energy. It takes energy to be a part of a community instead of just an attendee. Churches die when entropy takes over. We will move towards disorder and disunity if we are not investing energy in it. And that is why Paul is writing to Timothy. Last week, Ryan introduced us to Paul and Timothy, who first Timothy was written by and to. Paul is a leader of the early church. He wrote most of the books of the New Testament. He went on many mission trips, establishing the churches and cities all over the Roman Empire. Timothy is a young man. He's strong in the faith who Paul met on his travels and was so impressed by that he invited Timothy to join him on his journey. Paul thinks very highly of Timothy. And Paul has invested a great deal in him. Paul mentors him. Paul even considers Timothy to be like a son. And now, despite his young age, Timothy is a leader of the church in Ephesus, as Paul writes to him. And that's, that's the who of the letter. And for the rest of the summer, we're going to be exploring this first letter that Paul writes to Timothy. And this week, we're going we're gonna to see the why behind the letter. And Paul lays out his purpose for writing in chapter 3. I'm writing, writing these things to you now, even though I hope to be with you soon, so that if I'm, I am delayed, you will know how people must conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Timothy needs to clean house. Entropy has taken over his church. He is facing all sorts of issues that are causing division. Men are fighting, women are flaunting, elders are drinking, widows are uncared for. The law is being misused and false teachings about the gospel abound. It's going to take a lot of energy for, to clean up this mess that Timothy is facing in the church of Ephesus. So Paul reminds Timothy of this. This is the church of the living God the pillar and foundation of truth. God is the foundation. Shouldn't Timothy already know all of that? Well, consider the importance of the foundation. If you've ever spent time around construction, just regularly, even just regularly passing by a building in progress, which we're on campus, so by default, all of you have, um, all of you have experienced this, you may have noticed that it takes about just as long for them to finish the foundation as it takes for them to do like the rest of the building. Right, right now, there's a pit over on Tyndall. It's between University and Speedway. And someday that's gonna be another one of those like giant apartment buildings. But for months, it's just been a pit. And it's going to continue to be a pit for a while longer as they continue to work on setting the foundation. For months, there's just a hole in the ground, but once they fill that and they start going up, the building is up before you know it. And the reason for this is before you can build up, you must dig down. Think about something that doesn't have a foundation. 
sandcastles. A sandcastle can be built in an afternoon, but then it's gone just as quickly. The wind and waves naturally wash it away. And then compare that to something like the old bookmans on Grant and Campbell. Yeah. Well, now that the bookmans is gone, it was built on a solid foundation. It had been empty for years, but it wasn't going to just go anywhere you know, until it was torn down. Now, over time, decay and ruin would have set in, but it would have lasted much longer than a sandcastle. Buildings can stand for thousands of years when they are built well. Greater energy was put in at the start in setting the foundation, so entropy was much slower. In fact, it took energy to tear down the bookmans, much less energy than it took to build, but it still took energy. Entropy needed help. Putting in more energy now means we can build something that will last longer and can stand against entropy. And so that's why we care about the foundation. That's why Paul is reminding Timothy of the basics before he pours all of his energy into the work of setting his church right. He has to address the biggest, the most fundamental problems of them all first. Timothy has to make sure his church is set on the foundation of Jesus Christ before he manages and corrects all of those various conflicts and problems that he's facing. Paul is reminding Timothy of what he needs to teach and remind his people of. Reunite them on the big thing, the core, the foundation, before diving into all the other things. If they are united around Jesus, if Christ is at the center, everything else will come much more easily. And it's true for us as well. Without intervention, entropy will creep in and sow division in God's people. But if we start with a strong foundation, it saves us energy later. Let's consider Paul's reminder for ourselves. Is our foundation set? Is Christ at the center or is entropy creeping in? <coughs> Let's dig down. Timothy faced false teachers who missed the point and who needed correction. The message needed to be re-established on Jesus. So let us first consider, is Christ at the heart of our gospel? That may seem redundant. After all, is there any gospel without Christ? Yet when we often speak of the gospel, we leave something out. We teach the gospel only as salvation. Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead so that we might be saved. And don't get me wrong, i do not belittling that. That is amazing. That is amazing grace and is the most beautiful demonstration of love that the world's ever seen. Yet if, if that is the whole gospel, then that leaves out almost the entire gospels. In one of his other letters, Paul tells us that the gospel is much more than just the cross. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul summarizes the message. He summarizes the gospel for the Christians in Rome and for us. Yes, belief in Jesus' death and resurrection is a core part of it, but Paul preaches there's another part. Openly declare that Jesus is Lord. I think sometimes we say that Jesus is Lord, but I, I think we forget what that means. Lord isn't just another name for God, and I think we often use it just. It's just another name for God. Um, but Lord is a declaration of God's authority. It's a declaration of our complete submission of our lives to Jesus as we follow him. Now, I don't think we necessarily fail to talk about following Jesus and his teachings. But how often do we teach the gospel as salvation and submission? When we share the gospel with others, are we only selling fire insurance? Are we only sharing part of the story? If we're not sharing all of it, are we issuing a real invitation? Are we giving the whole message equal weight and importance in our own lives? If our gospel is not entirely founded on Jesus, all of Jesus, we skip over his life, his teachings, and ministry right to the end to his death and resurrection. When we do that, we don't only lose Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but more than that, we lose the whole Old Testament and the grand story it tells with Jesus as the great climax that it build, builds to. We miss the promise of revelation that Christ's kingdom will endure this world and reign forevermore. 
Declaring Jesus as Lord requires seeing the whole story, what was, what is, and what is to come, so that we understand all that he is Lord of, all that we are following, all that we are joining in on, all that we are committing our lives to, and all that we are obeying. Following Jesus isn't just a requirement, it's also an offering. Jesus offers us life, life that is truly life, not just through the cross, but through everything that he teaches. Entropy sets in because selling fire insurance is easier than commanding obedience. And the cross, not Christ, becomes the heart of our gospel. When we share the gospel, is our gospel just a ticket to salvation or an invitation to follow Jesus with our lives? Are we reading and teaching the whole gospel or just the end? Timothy's problems were more than just false teachers. His church was reeling. It was full of disorder and disunion. There was conflict in the pews as men fought with one another. Status and riches flaunted as women drew attention and praise away from God to themselves. Elders were in need of correction and widows were in need of care. If we don't want to see our church become like that, then we need to ask, is Christ the foundation of our church? (coughs) A church founded on Christ is a church united by Christ and not divided by all of the little things. I didn't like worship today. The food at hospitality was meh. I'm not getting fed spiritually or I don't, I don't like the color of the carpet. We need to check ourselves because we will grow inwardly focused because that's just easier. It is easier to expect others to be responsible for our spiritual growth. It is easier to accept an absence of outward conflict than, just work, than to actually work for real peace. It's easier to let others take the lead on serving. It's easier to just stay in our seat than go meet the new person. It is easier to think of ourselves than it is to think of others. It's easier to just go to church than it is to be the church. But scripture says that the church should be so much more than just a place we go once a week. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. (coughs) We are carefully joined together in him becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through you, through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Paul literally describes Christ as the cornerstone, the stone that is key to the whole structure. Without it, the building will fall. And we are the building built upon everyone who has come before. And that was true in the early days of the church when this was first written. And it's true now, millennia later, as we rest upon all of those who came before us in the church. And it'll be true into eternity as the building continues to rise. There's a mutual responsibility to being a part of the church. We aren't just attendees coming to be fed and then leave. We are part of a building. We hold others up as we are held up by others. We are turned outward to those around us and find those around us turned back to us. Together, we turn beyond this building to the rest of the world. We welcome everyone in. And there's no room for petty differences that divide us. And nor is there room for the great differences that divide us in the world. Paul's letter assures that the Gentile Christians, that they're no longer strangers and foreigners, but they are one with God's holy people, the Jewish people who had long been God's only chosen people. Now all lines that divide us are wiped away as the church is united upon Christ to the cornerstone. Politics, racism, sexism, and all the things that divide the world should not divide the church. When we are founded founded on Christ, we are neither Jew nor Gentile, black nor white, male nor female, liberal nor conservative, rich or poor, old or young, but we are one in Christ Jesus. Not that our differences cease to exist, but they cease to stand between us. And that they still divide us all the time shows how hard it is to resist division. How much energy it takes to maintain unity and how important it is to have Christ at the center. We are to be united as one people. Outsiders are invited in and welcomed in. 
instead of being instead of being measured by attendance or programs or worship or budget the church centered on christ is measured by how we are loving people the church stands tall and resists entropy when we rest upon christ but timothy's church was even further divided because so many were choosing themselves instead of choosing god they were focused inwards and only on themselves so what about us is christ at the center of our lives the easiest thing is always what takes the least energy and we are broken and we are sinful so there's a natural bent towards selfishness when christ is not at the center of our lives we start defaulting to what is easy and what is easy is often selfish our needs are always on our minds we cannot escape them but it takes energy to focus on others it is hard to get up on time and out the door so we cut out what is easy like our quiet time with god in exchange for some more time in bed it takes energy to reach out to our friends so we wish that they would initiate instead and they put the work in it takes up our free time to volunteer and serve time that we'd be tempted to save for something else so we'd rather not volunteer and risk missing out on another more fun opportunity or even if all we do is help others and give our time to our friends and neighbors Christ is not at the center of our lives if we do that simply because it is easier to say yes than it is to build healthy boundaries that allow us to love people well. Choosing to appear loving and unselfish to others can be easier than genuine love and unselfishness, but can in fact be unloving and selfish. It leads to exhaustion and bitterness on our part and disorder in our lives. But Jesus teaches his disciples what following him truly requires. Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, then you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you want to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But, but if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your own soul? Choosing to follow Jesus is no simple matter. Following Jesus takes effort. We take up our cross and follow him. And he doesn't just ask for part of our lives. He asks for all of it. A life centered around Christ doesn't make time for him every day. Instead, we build our days around Christ. A life centered around Christ doesn't wait for others to come love us. Instead, we pursue others with love as Christ pursues us. A life centered around Christ doesn't hold anything back from him, but also doesn't give more than we have either. Instead, we love and serve with what we have been given. Jesus teaches us that if we try to hang on to our life, even a little bit, we will lose it. But if we give it all to him, he saves it. He assures us that a life of following him is far greater than a life saved for ourselves. Paul tells us even more about what a life centered around Christ looks like. And now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. So it all comes back around. When Christ is at the center of our gospel, we declare that he is Lord. We build our lives on him and our faith grows out of that foundation that he has built. When Christ is at the center of our gospel, he's at the center of our lives as well. Now in a world of entropy, a world always moving towards chaos and disorder, how do we do this? How do I live my life with Christ at the center? Because even, um, even with a strong foundation, we are still subject to entropy. A clean house becomes messy again without regular cleaning and when our lives fill up and we feel busy and stressed we move towards what is easier and what takes less effort um, so practice spring cleaning our lives go through seasons in some seasons we're very disciplined maybe we have a season where we commit to good spiritual practices and, and during the season we read the bible we do a daily office every day perhaps we find a message really inspiring and so we are spending the next 66 days practicing silence and listening and then entropy hits us we enter a season of busyness or anxiety or distraction and our good habits slow down our bible in a year reading plan starts to look more like a bible in two years plan our daily offices become more monthly or maybe we've been on day 27 of a 66 day challenge for a few weeks now and while a, a strong foundation slows down entropy the house still gets messy and requires regular 
intervention. So we need a season for cleaning. Summer starts in one month, so that means there's still 31 days for some spring cleaning. Spend time in prayer. Ask God to help, help you see where your life is getting a little messy. What needs your attention? What needs intervention? What needs cleaning? Where has your focus shifted from God and what needs to be given back to God? Our life has seasons and it has rhythms. So from time to time, we need to, we need to check our habits and patterns. We need to check where we've been putting our trust. If we've check if we've been investing in our relationship with Jesus. We need to check our alignment with Christ. Have we gone off center? What is taking us out of alignment? What needs a cleanup? This is why every January we commit Catalyst, our, our winter retreat to spiritual practice to help us check on where our spiritual practice, our practices are at and give ourselves a little kickstart to get them going again. It's why we started the spring semester with vital signs. Ah. Sorry, I have like a sneeze just sitting there. Ah. It's, it's, we started the spring semester with vital signs so that we could review those areas of our lives that might require some renewal. Without intervention, entropy just continues to build up. So practice regularly giving focus and energy to checking where our lives are at with God. Then take a step back. How do I make sure that Christ is at the foundation of my church? Remember, a church founded on Christ is measured by how well it is loving people. And this is true for the whole church, but for us, it starts here with Damascus Road. I'm asking, how well are we loving people? And I'm also having to ask yourself, how well am I loving people? DR, you know, we work, we provide the water table on campus throughout the school year. Uh, DR does the food bank on the third Saturday of the other month. DR tries to connect people with opportunities for service like the Royal Family Kids Camp. But we can always be doing better. Loving one another better starts in our community and it starts with you being a friend, not waiting for someone to be your friend. Fight the entropy and reach out, get together. If there is a need that you are passionate about meeting in the world, don't just talk to someone else about it and hope that they get excited um, about it and then they try to get everyone else involved. Take the initiative yourself to start something and start serving and invite others along. Serving the refugee kids started because Jamie started doing it and then she got others like Will involved who could organize it once she no longer could. The food bank happened because Andrew got excited and he invited a few people to go help with one at another church and then that small group started it for us. Be the initiator. Everyone doesn't have to be passionate about the same thing, but if you care, chances are others will too. And our church will love others better as you do that and invite us all along. If you aren't ready to organize a whole new um, service project, but recognize that you need to do a better job of loving people outside of our community, start with the food bank next month or research groups that you could just join and volunteer with. Ryan and Renee are a couple of people who, in my experience, know of a lot of opportunities for service around Tucson. You can ask them. Then also ask, are we unified or are we divided as a church? You know, one of, a, one of the great dividers is conflict. If you have conflict with someone, settle it. Don't just brush it under the rug and avoid them every Sunday. Settle it. If you need mediation, staff can help. True unity, true peace is not the absence of conflict. It is doing the hard and messy work of addressing it and settling conflict. It requires working towards resolution and forgiveness. It is necessary to be in a church founded on Christ. We're also divided when we don't know one another. Unless you actually know everybody at DR, um, go meet someone new. Even if you've seen them every Sunday, but you've never had a real conversation, do it today. Ryan was telling me that uh, Heidi did this with Andrew yesterday at the food bank. They saw each other on campus this week and realized they knew each other, but weren't really sure why, except for DR. So at the food bank yesterday, Heidi brought it up and introduced herself to Andrew. And next time they see each other on campus or at church, they are one step closer to being friends, to building a relationship. 
Now, I know there might be a fear of awkwardness. Um, it, it can feel like it's a little too late to introduce yourself to someone who you've seen every week for months. It can feel weird meeting somebody when you already know their name because Facebook keeps suggesting that you friend them. I get it. It's awkward. But I'm up here giving everybody all permission. Like, that cuts out at least some of that awkwardness. And let me point out something else, something out here that was just pointed out to me the other day. You know, we're not supposed to be divided by things that divide the world, but in general, um, if you compare the average ages of the two sides of the room, you know, you leave out the babies, you leave out visiting families, we may, you know, if you compare that, we may look a little divided. I'm just saying, you know, I'm not saying any of that's intentional, but also, we all have our spot. And I'm going to be honest, I could roughly guess where most of you will sit from week to week. I might be off by like a row or a seat, but in general, like, I know where people sit. And that's okay. We get comfortable and we get into rhythms, but if we don't check ourselves, we stick to just what's comfortable. It's easy to sit in the same place. It's easy to just sit with the same people. It's easy to talk to the same friend after church rather than meet someone new. But if we all keep doing that week after week, then our church grows divided. We develop cliques and little pockets of people who don't know one another. And it's hard to love someone when we don't put in the effort to get to know them. So next week, mix it up. Let's mix it up. Let's try sitting somewhere different. Step out of your comfort zone and sit somewhere different next to someone that you don't normally sit with. Cross the aisle. Well, maybe not everybody because then we just flip the problem. But like some, some of you, cross the aisle and be a, be a part of helping our church be more unified, a community with Christ as the foundation. The natural order of this world is from order to chaos. That's the lesson of entropy. Our clean houses get dirty again. People will be divided. Individuals will default to selfishness. And one day when all the energy is used up and only entropy is left, the universe will die. In a closed system, entropy will always increase until there is nothing left. Without intervention, entropy takes over. Fortunately, someone intervened. Entropy is not only held off when Christ is at the heart of the gospel, at the foundation of the church, and the center of our lives, but it is defeated when Christ is the king of the kingdom. In his letter, Paul not only reminds Timothy that God is the foundation, he reminds him of this. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. All glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king. Entropy, sin, brokenness says that everything will die one day. Without God, our world is a closed system descending into chaos. The house is a mess and it will only be getting worse. But Christ, the eternal king, intervenes. Brokenness is restored, sin is forgiven, and entropy is reversed. We are invited to live in a kingdom without end by the king who alone is God. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, I pray we set our foundation on you, Lord, that we build our lives on you, the cornerstone of the church, the king of the kingdom, Lord. You alone are eternal. You never die. You are the king forever and ever. Amen.